As a pioneer, the questions he asks himself as an artist, of course, are similar to all the questions the artists on display here are asking themselves. The function of art, the identity of the artist, the role of the artist in society, uh, what is beauty, what not, the creative process, and all of that. But Nagi, in addition, has another challenge. It's to find a modern Egyptian grammar, a, an Egyptian language. So we can say that Nagi is one of the letters in response to the exhibition curated here, the 29th letter. He, in my opinion, is one of the letters. Okay, so... Um, the first graduates of the School of Fine Arts that opened in 1908 were sent to Europe to perfect their studies. So I call this the context of learning. So the trip to the West has as an objective to perfect a certain training. Artists were not the only ones concerned. Before them, it was the scientists sent by um, Muhammad Ali to learn modern science and military art. So the first ones who went to Europe, it would take them 33 days to do the crossing with boat. In Nagi's time, it was four days. This is to say that the European other, with a big O, was not so far away. Of course, he was also in his own country, but traveling there is um, something else. So the trip to the West, the West here refers to Europe, not the United States, okay? And this research is part of a PhD that I am pursuing uh, with the Sorbonne in Paris. The title of the PhD is Occidentalism. I don't know if you're familiar with the word. Occidentalism, representation of Europe and Europeans in uh, post-colonial Egypt in uh, painting and literature and to a lesser extent in cinema. So there isn't just one Occidentalism, they are uh, several ones. And immediately something, this word must echo another one in your minds, which is Orientalism, in which the trip to the East plays a huge role. What role is that? Well. Mostly it's um, as per um, an art historian whose research delves into Orientalism, Christine Peltre, a French one. The trip to the East is the workshop or the studio of Orientalism. It's the place where all the quick sketches are made in watercolor, Oriental objects are bought and brought back to Europe, little mosaics, uh, landscapes that recall biblical settings ran through the streets, for the uh, travelers, the Western travelers. And it was also a place of transformation as many could dress up in Oriental costumes. So when they returned home, the painters created an image of the exotic, theatrical, luxurious, carnal Orient, a place that uh, kind of showed the Arab as the total other or the radical other with the big O. So I asked myself, what role did the trip to the West play in the evolution of an Egyptian artist? Uh, now, in literature, the trip to the West is something that has been studied thoroughly. I don't know if you're a bit famili familiar with uh, Tahtawi's Rihla and uh, the book he wrote after his trip. He was one, uh, he, he was the person, the imam, who accompanied the group of students sent by Muhammad Ali to study in Europe. But he did not limit himself to being an imam there. He also wrote, like an autobiography or semi-autobiography, uh, and it's called Takhlis al-Ibriz fi Telkhis Paris, which is translated into French under the title Le raffinement de l'or, l'abrégé de Paris. So he brings, okay, the purpose of this was to send Egyptians, learn know-hows, and bring them back to Egypt to replace the foreigners who were in several key positions job-wise because they were much more costly to keep, okay? 
for the dynasty of Muhammad Ali. So Tahtawi brings back a story from his journey, and that story constitutes the point of entry to the land of the Franks, or Afrang, for all those who could not travel. Not everybody could travel, could afford to travel back then. So his travelogue becomes a first way of looking at the West, and that's an admirative way, an idealized one. It's followed by that of Ali Mubarak, another promoter of the Egyptian Renaissance, who exposes different uh, aspects of life in France. And finally, there's another rihla that is important, kept by, um, uh, I mean, in the literary studies. It's Al-Rihla al thaniya by Muhammad Al-Mouaylihi because it's translated in French under Trois Voyageurs à Paris because it shows three different attitudes we can have towards the West. One that is known as Mbihar, so idealizing Europe. One that is called, uh, one, it's ambiguousness. It's negative and positive in the same time. And the third one is a total rejection that is based on a very critical attitude towards the West. On the other hand, in the visual arts, the trip to the West is seldom mentioned. It's, uh, the studies are almost non-existent. Among the few books that deal with it, uh, we can mention Nadia Radwan's book, Les Modernes d'Egypte. Uh, she aims to write a history of uh, fine and applied arts in Egypt based on Egyptian national archival documents. So an entire chapter is devoted to those artists who travel abroad. She gives examples of Mahmoud Mukhtar, Muhammad Hassan, Raghib Ayad, among others. Um, as she points out, this trip to the West constitutes usually four lines in Egyptian historiography. Who traveled where, how much they stayed, how many years they studied, the prize they gained, if they gained one, and uh, what uh, position they obtained uh, on their return. So this context of traveling to learn from the West usually constitutes an elevation in social status for the travelers. Once they return, those artists are placed in key positions here in their country, at least back then, okay? Uh, today, it's, things are much more complicated. So such was the contrast between education here and there that those s graduate students become directors. I don't know if you realize uh, this uh, difference. So the purpose of this presentation is to understand the role played by the trip to the West in the artistic evolution of Nagy and to see what type of Occidentalism his point of view uh, belongs to. It doesn't make any sense to talk about the trip to the West as if it's one trip, so from a quantitative point of view, because he traveled so much to Europe that we actually can't keep track of. Okay? But it does make a sense to speak about a journey to the West, in his case, um, because it's one journey that includes several stage, stages or stations, each one constituting a trigger towards a certain evolution, whose ultimate goal, in Nagi's case, is a certain uh, harmony. So the destinations, among the destinations he went to, cities or countries, we can mention Marseille, Lyon, Florence, Paris, Gif, Rio, Switzerland, Prague, Montenegro, Ethiopia. It's considered to be, he went there in 1932, and he brought back a body of work that is uh, considered to be his most excellent uh, artistic production by historians like Dawistashi and Yusril Kuwaiti, but I'm not going to talk about that period, I'm just mentioning it here. Rome, London, Cyprus, Venice, Paris again and again and again, and Athens also again and again for a particular reason I'll mention later. So, um, although these trips are take place in space, the stations have to do more with time. So. We have four different time periods that play an important part in the thinking process of Nagy. The Greco-Roman antiquity, the time of the ancient Egyptian art, contemporary Europe, contemporary Egypt, they are not the same. And uh, we finish with Greco-Roman antiquity. So these are the fine five stations we are going to study.
So as I told you before, he went to study first law and all the time he was studying law, he did not drop visual arts. He had a talent from when he was young. And actually he started by writing poetry before and from his poems you can already see a, a love for his country, we can say, because he wrote epic poems. Uh, one of them was titled Harus and Nil, which would be also the title of a famous uh, sculpture piece by Mahmoud Mukhtar later on whose model apparently was his French girlfriend. So, um, something to think about. This is from 1906, before he started studying, so we can already see his talent. I think, yeah, okay. Monsieur Piatoli, his Italian teacher. Uh, he went to the Swiss school in Alexandria. And these are from the drawings uh, from his uh, time, the time he spent in Florence. So he, studies at, he studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in the section called La Scuola Libero del Nudo from 1910 to 1914. He developed an extraordinary talent as a draftsman. Uh, he was trained in pencil drawing. Uh, but you can see that really his concern is not to give an illusionistic 3D volume rendering of, uh, of the pieces. These are uh, part of his uh, sketches. They were not meant for display. You have five drawings on display here. In one we can already see the one here. A certain interest in the color of the figure the way the uh, face is painted. So it's a mix of pencil and colored pencils. And in these ones that I like very much, we can uh, really see how in very little lines he can grab the uh, essence of the person in movement. This is a Greek dancer, the typical Greek dancer. Here we have two other drawings. This perspective is quite difficult to achieve for shortening, okay? Um, there's a very famous one, The Lamentation of Christ by Mantegna, in which the Christ occupies a position like this. Why is it difficult? Because the body is in such an angle that um, uh, you can easily miss and it can easily seem like uh, uh, a bad drawing, which is not the case here. This one, so these are not meant for display, they are not really finished, okay? But I really find in them, especially in this one, uh, a violin player, so you can really feel the music. It's mostly made out of um, curved lines. Again, uh, this is uh, pastel colors, actually, on paper, okay? Here, a buffalo, a favorite subject for Nagy for different reasons. So it's a bit Fauvist, if you're familiar with Fauvism. And these are some of the oil, uh, oil on canvas works that he did during his period of study. So three sisters in Switzerland, uh, Florence Tower, uh, another landscape from Pompeii. And on the left here we have an example of the nude painting based on live drawing, live uh, drawing models in uh, the school in Florence. So he was trained in the classical tradition and besides attending the courses he was busy creating copies of the masters of the Italian Renaissance with whom he was very much impressed and learned the vocabulary. Which vocabulary is that? It's what da Vinci calls the fact the act of painting being a cosa mentale, a thinking process, and not just copying stuff. So symbolism, uh, how to use uh, the elements in the painting, and so on. Um, he was uh, also impressed by the French classical school, and in this period he managed to forge a visual encyclopedia. He came to know Rubens, Rembrandt, two painters he loved, David Ancre, Benjamin West, Diego Riviera, to name a few. He did copies of Jacob's Ladder and St. Catherine. Um, one of the visitors to an exhibition uh, in a museum in which he was doing the copy, but obviously he had gone for a break, 
had written on the back of the copy, uh, excellent work, perfect copy of Rubens, and signed an unknown visitor and fan. So the difference with the other schools is that you don't finish with a final evaluation project. That's why some people call Nagy as a self-taught, call him a self-taught artist. All this work would have to be done by himself. In Florence, he met a friend with whom he kept a long relationship, Milo Milonovic, from Yugoslavia. And he was also in touch with Ungaretti, an Italian poet from Alexandria, who did not depict the cosmopolitan Alexandria of Laurence Durel as in the uh, Alexandria Quartet, but rather an, uh, a harsh Alexandria, that of the underground, the communists, the anarchists, the lowlands, and unhealthy neighborhoods. So we see already that um, Nagy has, because of his cosmopolitan background, he's very open-minded, and he has a very rich and diverse background. Okay? Why was classicism so important from Nagy besides being a great technical training school, according to you? Well, going to Europe and discovering that a, a big chunk of classical Europe is based on Greek and Roman antiquity meant for him that the civilizations who were progressive at that time actually owed a great deal to older civilizations. And this is the first realization of whoever travels to Europe, at least in the time of Nagy. Okay, so that's one conclusion. Um, during his studies in uh, Florence, he would come regularly back to Egypt uh, for holidays, and he rent a studio in Darb al Labana in, an, uh, in a house characterized by Islamic architecture that had kept its original uh, character. So again, here we see another level of influence in Nagi. It was also close to the uh, Museum of Arab Art, um, in which he could see uh, the oldest Quran, he could see uh, mosque lamps, uh, and so he was visually in touch with also the Islamic artistic heritage. So we see that the number of influences are actually very big, okay? The second station is ancient Egypt and Egyptology. So um, in the winter, whenever he would come back from Florence, he would go to Luxor to visit Sheikh Abdel Rasul, a family acquaintance. He built a studio there, and from his studio, he could see the Colossi of Memnon guarding the city. He painted many themes from there. This is a black and white reproduction. Sorry, I don't have colored reproductions for all of them. I'll tell you about the difficulties of research at the end of the talk. So this is the Alley of the Rams, okay? The Temple of Karnak. And he would not only do the copies of the Italian masters or French masters, but also of the Theban wall paintings. These left a very strong imprint in his mind. He was actually the first one to understand their plastic possibilities, okay? So uh, we are still in the 1910s, and there's a very famous book that will appear in 1960 by a friend of Nagy, André Lotte, a French painter, called The Masterpieces of Egyptian um, Painting, and actually he shows these Theban uh, frescoes. And he talks, André Lot about them as being uh, fauvist and cubist in a sense, okay? And he would talk about the offering table as the first still lives. You know that in fine art we have typical subject matters, portrait, still life, genre, history, and so on. So, um, okay. Mean, so he, he owes a great deal to Nagy, André Lot, actually, okay? Because when he came, before he printed the book, 
He came in the 50s. It was a period where foreigners were not anymore welcome to Egypt, and uh, nobody was there to host André Lot from uh, the administration of the, the fine arts. It was Nagy and his sister Effat who did the job and filled in this gap. And of course, you can imagine that you exchange with artists. So Nagy, 50 years before or 30 years before, was already thinking in that way. Um, so meanwhile, in the 20s and the 30s, Egyptology was thriving in Europe, and that's the second realization for those who travel to Europe. It's not that they are just based on older civilizations. Uh, but, so Egyptology in what way? In the British Museum, the collection, since the early times, mid-18th century, it already had a collection of Egyptian antiquities. Bonaparte's uh, theft would be confiscated by the British, okay? With the famous Rosetta Stone that would be deciphered in 1822 by Champollion, thanks to exchanges that he had with Coptic refugees in France, okay? So this is to show all the cultural relations that exist between, uh, between the countries. So as a field of study, it was, uh, Egyptology was born in France as a field of study and it was a big communion between the countries. The first directors of the um, uh, Antiquities in Egypt would be Auguste Mariette, a French one, and they would make everything to keep this position, the French, okay? You also have the British, the Germans, and Americans, okay? So going to Europe and understanding that, seeing that uh, Egyptology is thriving makes them realize also that there's something missing what is that according to you? So they see ancient Egypt, but they don't see the contemporary Egypt. The modern Egypt is nowhere, okay? And that's a task Nagy would put on himself to depict this modern Egypt. Um, so he was also reading a Russian avant-garde magazine, Jar Ptitsa in which there, were, there was one modern representation of an, uh, of an Arab character. It's a bit racial representations in this avant-garde magazine, Arts and Literature. This is a felah, okay? It's a pencil drawing. However, uh, so you know the role played by the Russian avant-garde in Paris. It was extremely big, okay? He would continue painting... Um, uh, topics that are typically Egyptian. Here we see a change in style, okay, with much bolder colors. So the first realization was that modern civilized nations owe a great deal to older civilization, and that continues with the realization that these older great civilizations owe a great deal to his own civilization. Okay, what role did the European avant-garde play in the uh, thinking process of Nagy? So uh, you probably know about, uh, it's 550? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So we are in Giverny after World War I, and uh, Europe is not the same after the, wor the First World War. It's uh, a disaster or disorder. There are all these new avant-gardes. We have, in 1918, already Les Demoiselles d'Avignon by Picasso, Mount Saint Victory by Cézanne, uh, Red Dessert by Matisse, uh, this is Kirchner, Expressionism, Fauvism, um, beginning of Cubism, uh, post-impressionism leading to abstraction, and Malevich's Black Square. So Nagy witnessed all this and he was in shock, okay? He's like, there's something here that seems to be based on new references. But all the debates about what art is and what art isn't were a bit too much for him. 
So he was really trying to search for his own identity and that's when he decides to go to Giverny where Claude Monet, the father of Impressionism, reside, resides. I don't know if you know his water lilies. Very, very impressive, beautiful paintings. Claude Monet was 78 years old. Now, Egyptian historiography tends to make a great big deal out of uh, this stay of Nagy at uh, Monet. I doubt that he gave him lessons. But what we know for sure, based on one letter, is that uh, uh, Nagy showed him his paintings and asked for his opinion. To which Monet responded that uh, it's great, you should continue on this path, but have more audacity in the usage of color. So this is Monet in front of his huge house with the garden. I think that Monet at the end of his uh, lifetime reached the realization that you just don't need to paint but contemplate nature. You know that Impressionism was about the impression of nature and he said it's like bead ticklings and everything changes one second after the other, nothing is the same. So how can you grasp that on a, on a painting? The time is not different, so just contemplate. And this is a picture taken by Nagy himself while in Giverny. So I'm not going to read you an excerpt of his letters, but it would show you uh, his French. The mastery of his French language is extraordinary. Okay, of Nagy, but uh, what he was afraid of with all these avant-garde was to break with tradition. So he really did not want to be drifted by all these avant-garde. Uh, what we can say here is um, modernity in the West, as pointed out by uh, uh, Nada Shabut uh, in her book. Uh, um, formation of Arab aesthetics is that modernity in the, in the West constitutes a rupture with classicism. Whereas in the Arab world, it's actually a link back to the heritage. So on one hand, we have modernity as a rupture with heritage in the West, and on the other hand, we have modernity as a link to heritage. Very two different motions. So he was trying to find for a link between the ancient Egyptian art, Islamic art, modern art, and classical art, and this link would come to him from Cubism and André Lot. Why? Because this uh, movement, uh, André Lot actually, he belonged to a group called La Section d'Or, and I don't know if you know about the Golden Section, but it's uh, a theory that says that behind, uh, behind everything beautiful, there are the numbers. So we come back to geometry. And cubism, as theorized by Cezanne, was about trying to see behind every object and its specific accent, uh, the geometry behind it. So look at nature in terms of the cone, the cylinder, and the sphere. So geometry has to do with the divine, and that's the link, this geometric aspect, behind all of these uh, movements, at least for Nagy. Here we see the golden section applied on different monuments, the Court of Lions in Alhambra, a temple or a cathedral. It's also in different works of art. So by finding this link, he managed, he felt more comfortable, number one, exploring his own route, and number two, continuing his impetus towards the West because he was not afraid to lose himself. Um, the fourth st station is contemporary Egypt. So we are in 1919 with the revolution, uh, Nagy felt the need to respond to it, and he created this huge mural, but it's on a panel actually, that was placed in the Maglis el-Shura in 1923. It's called La Renaissance de l'Egypte ou le Cortège d'Isis. Uh, so, the awakening of Egypt or the Cortège of Isis. So here we start to see which type of vocabulary he wants to develop in his artwork. We have uh, many gestures echoing each other, just like in uh, the Italian uh, Renaissance paintings. We have naked figures together with clothed ones. Uh, this bent gestures echoes the uh, standing stature of this one. So it's all the people of rural Egypt who are gathered around Isis, 
with different offerings, the fruit of the, of the land and objects. This is Hathor. What strikes us is the greenery, so the fertility of the land, okay? And the brightest spot is Isis. So again, what lacks here is the modern, is modern Egypt, okay? Awakening Egypt is the title, uh, it's, it has been treated before by an American sculptor, strangely enough, in 1897, called Elwell. Okay, then he would meet um, Juliette Adam. She wrote a very influential book called England in uh, Egypt that uh, it was kind of, uh, it pushed a lot of the intellectuals, also Mustafa Kemal, it gave them a support, the support they needed. So uh, he painted her in two versions, okay? It was the year also when his mother died in 1922, and he does these two. So she signs a copy of the book for him. Um, then we have, uh, as another important uh, trip to the West, a diplomatic incident that happens in Prague in 1922 between him and the uh, administrator of the fine arts, which was a French person, Louis Hautecoeur, in a congress, the first congress for popular arts. So uh, I don't know if I should uh, continue focusing on that because we are running out of, out of time. But uh, what has been kept by this story, in, uh, even in a book by MoMA, is not very accurate. Things are more complex than that. Uh, so Nagy just uh, presented uh, a speech to say that popular arts are alive in Egypt and gave many examples and concluded by saying they should even be taught in the fine arts school. So you know there's always this distinction between fine arts and popular arts. Hautecoeur said, but what is popular art? Can we define popular art? Is it just a remain of an older, of a version that seems familiar but it's not really alive and so on and so forth? Uh, however, because Nagy challenged his authority, he stopped being a diplomat. He, didn't ha he, he lost his status as a diplomat because of this incident. The communications in the archives do not keep Egypt as one of the participating states. We have here 30 countries that are mentioned. I think because of this issue and because Hautecoeur wasn't prepared apparently for this uh, conference, Egypt does not appear in the communication. However, the, an interest would spark in Nagy for folklore, okay? So he's one of the first ones to be interested so much in Egyptian folklore. What's nice about him is that he doesn't, he is nationalist, but he, I call it an extrovert nationalist. I don't know if it exists, but it's like um, he's totally against being isolated to move on, on the contrary. So, we see here different uh, subjects that he uh, develops. Uh, this is in the countryside, Abu Homos, where they had uh, many uh, lands and uh, their family house. This is his father. You notice him here taking pictures, and actually photography was part of his process, as we can see here in these two slides. Okay, this is a painting based on the photograph. Uh, moving on with this folkloric uh, theme, he would do a series of five panels for a hospital, Muasa in Alexandria, that show medicine through time. And we notice again that the modern period is just removed, okay? So uh, medici medicine among, in the village, uh, amongst the ancient Egyptians. Using slightly Gauguin's uh, language in this uh, symbolic distortion of perspective here. Here these, here, these are the three paintings on site. And one of them, the, the fifth one, was about King Fuad, so the first Egyptian king, laying the first stone of this hospital. We notice here that he took pictures of his paintings and sent them as postcards. That's also something interesting. We have here two different postcards. Okay, uh, working uh, in front of the panels. So, in Athens, he gave a conference in uh, a place called L'Atelier d'Athènes, and on his return, he built the Atelier of Alexandria. He also would do the Atelier in Luxor in 41, and then the one in Cairo, the, all these three. 
So I think you realize by now that every trip to the West gave him very inspired him a lot to come and uh, take on or build the nation culturally speaking. So essential was for him these trips. In 1937, Egypt participates in the um, Exposition uh, Universelle and uh, the International of 1937. This is the Egyptian Pavilion. What do you think about it? Okay. So what's interesting is that uh, André Lot, his friend, would decorate the French pavilion in which they would celebrate future and modernism. So this is Lusina Gaz, okay, we have here the crane. While Nagy, on the other hand, would decorate with very flat murals that show rural life. Okay, and we have the famous Tears of Isis here in its colored uh, version as well. Now, if you notice, this is another painting of his called To the Market. If you notice this cart with the group of figures, the animal and the dog, you will see them here. Okay? So this is really another insight into his creative process, taking motifs a little bit like Rodin and his uh, doors of uh, hell from which he would take and isolate figures and make them stand out, standing sculptures like the thinker. It originally appears in um, the doors of hell. That's what exactly what um, Nagy is doing. So yes, he is taking the past as a metaphor for the present as uh, historians like Nadia Radwan say, but he doesn't just do that. There's a very um, beautiful French word called passeiser or passeifié. How can we translate that in English? He would render ancient, modern, contemporary Egypt, okay, to associate it with the glory of the past and immortality. So, um, okay, the last station is Greece. Uh, Greece, you know, is the link between the West and the East, in my opinion, okay? So, in the 50s, uh, until 1955, one year before he dies, he went to Cyprus very often because his wife was Cypriot, Lili Catavernari. Uh, things didn't go very well in the marriage. She was already married and had children and divorced. So Nagy fought for the independence through his paintings, so he's not just participating in, the, in this Egyptian Nahda, but also he gave a hand to um, Cyprus with a painting called Enosis, in which we see, I only have the sketched reproduction. He did do an oil painting version of it, but a small one. He did not get the time to do the big one, so we can call this the smallest history painting of in history, okay, belonging to the historic genre. This is Makarios, he's the Archbishop of Cyprus, who wanted to unify Cyprus with Athens and uh, get rid of the British uh, rule over Cyprus, who took it as its new uh, land, okay? So we have in these three visuals one character that is similar, can you spot him? Yes, it's this one here. Now, what's very interesting, so I think it's a Greek person wearing traditional costumes. He seems to be like a shepherd with his staff. But what's interesting, so again, it's this idea of working with motifs and constructing an image, as I said before, the cosa mentale, okay? It's not just an imitation of what is in front of you. Uh, we don't know exactly what, who he is. He, it might be a stand-in for Nagy, I don't know. And here what's very interesting are these two protrusions, like horns. I don't want to go and guess and say that he feels like the shepherd or Moses, because Moses is the one who is portrayed, because I don't know, uh, I'm not sure yet. It's a question that is open. The last uh, station is uh, his participation in the Venice Biennale with the School of Alexandria. That is for him the synthesis of all his work, thinking process and artistic process. 
He wanted to, so we are in 52, the revolution happened, um, and he thought this would be a, a great message. Okay, so for him, always an artwork had to have a message. It's something to be questioned today, but for he, had, uh, he was on a mission. He's actually gathering the Arabs, sorry, the Arabs on the left and the Greeks around the figure of Alexander the Great, okay? We can see here this mosaic, it's a, the famous mosaic of Alexander the Great in Pompeii. Of course, he's making a reference to the School of Athens by Raphael, where you have the central figures of Plato and Aristotle in the blue and the red gown here. These are the Greeks and the Arabs as the basis of knowledge. So we see here the Mediterranean Sea unifying both, okay? Uh, he again comes back here to a one-point perspective. That's very interesting. So he is shifting uh, the space of knowledge, I can say, and putting it in Alexandria. So we start from Alexandria and we finish in Alexandria, and I'm gonna conclude now. Um, so these five stations do not end, but they rather overlap, just as his creative process. He would leave all his paintings unfinished and open and come and rework them. The day he died, they discovered he was working on the first painting he started, La Cueillette des Dates. So the trip to the West in the case of the cosmopolitan, well-read Mohammed Nagy led back to himself, both in terms of cultural appraisal, but also artistically speaking, since he adopted the techniques of the Italian masters and the whole fine arts tradition, but to a different purpose. He tried developing an Egyptian grammar, a modern one anchored in tradition, through his journey and with a constant dialogue with Europe. He tried to deconstruct the colonial gaze and offer Egypt as the locus of universality instead of Europe. So Egypt as the place of knowledge production. In my opinion, this is his most fundamental contribution. So the trip to the West can therefore be seen in the case of Muhammad Nagy paradoxically as the workshop of a certain Egyptianity. Um, that's it. So I want to thank uh, Art d'Egypte and Nadine Abdel Ghaffar. And I also want to thank Ismat Dawistashi, Hussam Rashwan, and Ali Saeed from the Museum of Fine Arts in Alexandria. Um, do you have questions? No? That's it.